Every conductive material can have electrical resistance. But there are a couple of components that we use for which it's really its defining characteristics. So we're going to look at those and then look at a very common structure, circuit structure called a voltage divider, which uses these. Here's a couple of components. I'm going to zoom the camera in a bit. On the left is a common uh, resistor. It's actually a quarter watt carbon composition resistor uh, with very linear, linear characteristics. It has the two terminals or the two wires sticking out the ends. And in between is this lump of matter, which has been calibrated to have a specific range of resistance values. In the middle is a switch, a little push button switch. And if I turn it over, you can see it has some electrical leads. Uh, there are four legs, but it's actually two individual circuit nodes. And a switch is a special resistor. It has either very low, we'll assume zero resistance, when it's closed and pushed, but then opens and when it's unpushed to have effectively infinite resistance. So it's a kind of two-state resistance. But it introduces the idea that a component might have a variable resistance, some kind of resistance that changes. The third component is a photocell, which has a resistance that depends upon the light impinging on it. It has a cadmium sulfide chem chemistry, which the resistance varies quite a bit. And when the light is very bright, gets kind of low, maybe a few thousand ohms. And when the light is very dark, it gets very high, uh, as high as millions of ohms. Again, it's a two-terminal device, which uh, the wires coming off it are the, are the physical terminals that represent the, the electrical terminals. So those are some con kind of components. Let's think a little bit about how we en might end up using these in circuits, um, especially the ones that vary. So a very important cir circuit structure I'll draw now, it's called a voltage divider. And we're going to start with some kind of voltage source. I'm just going to draw a battery here. And then assume we ha that we have two resistors in series. In series means connected end to end to form a single loop here. So there's some voltage that we apply from the battery. And we're going to assume that we have R1 and R2, which are the two uh, branches of the divider. And then there's a node in the middle. And we're going to just assume that we can probe that node and get some kind of output voltage measurement. Um, and then for convenience, once again, we're going to assume that this bottom leg is ground and in zero volts. So we can measure V out with respect to the ground zero. So V out is just a single number. As a special case, we're going to assume that we're not drawing any current at that middle node. So that the, that the I out, the current that might come along that, we're going to say is zero. So we're not connecting anything to it that has any way allowing current to flow. Effectively, we put like an infinite resistance across that node to ground. Um, in order to see the V out. That'll simplify the analysis, and for a lot of our circuits actually holds pretty true. So let's think about how we might figure out what V out is, um, given some values for the R1 and R2 resistors. So the first observation to make is just is to go back and look at Ohm's law and say, well, V out is the same as the voltage across R2. So using Ohm's law, we might say V out equals the current through uh, 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 resistor 2 times its value. Now we don't know yet R2. We'll assume it's a known value when we finally try to use the formula, but um, we especially don't know I2. I2 is some current that's flowing through the resistor, I2. One thing we can look at is we can apply Kirchhoff's current law to assume that the currents through each of the resistors is the same current. Once, we, once we've decided that no current is flowing out of the node at the middle of the divider, then any charge flowing into R1 has to flow out through R2. It can't go anywhere. So we can say that I1, the current through R1, um, is the same as the current through R2. They're, they're equal. We can also now apply Kirchhoff's voltage law to look at the voltage around the loop. So there's a battery voltage, and we're looking around the loop from the bottom, the battery to the top. That's some negative voltage. And then the voltage coming down uh, comes across the two resistors. So we can see that there's a, a, a voltage between across R1 from the top node to the middle of the bridge, and then a voltage from the across R2 from the middle bridge to ground. But that total voltage has got to be equal to the battery voltage. And that comes from uh, basically applying Kirchhoff's um, voltage law. So V, which is uh, the input here, is equal to V1, the voltage drop across resistor 1, and V2, the voltage drop across resistor 2. So once again, this was ohm, this was uh, current law, and this was voltage law. So now let's think about how we get to the point that we can actually derive the output voltage from the input resistances. 
I can go back now and think about this last term and um, think about trying to get to the currents. So if I simply apply, if I apply Ohm's law, right, then what I'll see is that V equals um, I times R1 plus I times R2. This is applying Ohm's law to, ex to expand the V1 and V2 terms of the previous line. That can be regrouped. I can see that V uh, equals I times R1 plus R2, just an algebraic restatement. And then continuing the algebra, I can get a value for I. I equals V divided by R1 plus R2. I'll bring that into view. And then again, that is algebraic rewriting. There's no uh, special laws involved with that. At this point, I can go back and apply Ohm's law one more time because we already know that uh, from the very, very first line at the top, which you can see here, right, um, that um, I2 is related to V out and R2. So if I simply substitute on the left side here, uh, the values um, from that first, the, sorry, the expression from that first line, I get that I is equal to um, V out divided by R2 equals now V over R1 plus R2. And at this point, I can simply do in one final algebraic rewrite to move the R2 over, and I get V out equals the source voltage V times R2 over R1 plus R2. And this is our basic expression for this kind of voltage divider. We've simplified it by declaring that the bottom is ground and that there's no current at the central node, um, but this is a very common form we'll see a lot, so it's really worth sort of paying attention to this. One immediate special case is if R1 equals R2, then it reduces down to one half. And one way to think about that is that current is flowing across this bridge it, it loses some energy coming down one resistor. It loses the then if it's equal, the same energy going down the second resistor. So the potential at the middle is just the is just half the original source potential. It's at the midpoint. That's a very important special case that we'll see. To apply this, we'll go on. We'll look at a number of sample circuits that use this. But just to recap where we are, we looked at a couple of specific components, particularly the resistor, switch, and photocell. Um, we looked a little bit at this voltage divider circuit, which is two resistances that are connected in series, which produces a kind of variable voltage at the middle that depends both upon the voltage applied across the bridge, as well as the relative ratio of the resistances within the bridge. That'll help us build out some sensor circuits and input circuits, and also, um, which is the essence of connecting the physical world to our microcontrollers.